Hi, everybody. It's Thursday, and it's time for your weekly dose of Future Law Bootcamp. I'm your host, Joe Borstein, CEO of LexFusion and Total Freak about legal innovation. Today, I'm here with Elizabeth Miller, head of legal operations at Dolby. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. As always on Future Law, the lawyers of tomorrow meet the change makers of today. We're going to discuss the tectonic forces bubbling under the surface of the $800 billion legal industry. Globalization is allowing lawyers and other professionals from all over the earth to collaborate seamlessly on legal work. Technology is automating routine processes and slowly but steadily crawling up the value chain. The status quo of legal regulation is being challenged and questioned and is even today allowing lawyers uh, outside of the Bar Association to work alongside other professionals and solve legal problems at scale, which I think is amazing, and also enjoy some of the profits of traditional legal work. And finally, Outside investors are pouring in. These investors see an opportunity to make a broken system dramatically better. Futurist Peter Diamantes likes to say, if you want to make a billion dollars, figure out how to help a billion people. That always stuck with me. Law affects every single solitary person on this planet. There are so many people to help and so much money to make in the process. So whatever drives you, idealism, greed, or just excitement, I beg all lawyers and allied professionals to pay a little attention to the legal innovation space. You might just find your purpose here. So today, again, I'm here with Elizabeth Miller, head of legal operations at Dolby, after a long stint running legal operations at Boston Scientific. She has now created two legal op operations functions at two amazing brand name companies, um, but two companies that are in very different industries with very different priorities and very different regulatory regimes. Today, we're going to dig in a little bit on, uh, on, on what that was like and what we can learn uh, uh, about the future of law uh, from Elizabeth. So, Elizabeth, uh, let's start with an easy one. Tell us about Dolby and your path uh, to the world of legal operations. Sure. Uh, so, Dolby, I've been at Dolby for about five and a half years now. Um, I manage everything that is basically non-legal work. So, kind of the, the vision of legal operations is taking on anything that distracts the lawyers from being lawyers. So the business end of the legal department. Um, at Dolby, I have spent a lot of time focused on technology. That's where our biggest need was. Uh, just setting us up to scale and modernizing the tools that we have and getting rid of any redundancies. Um, that's been my primary focus. Uh, my start in Boston Scientific was very different because I was in a highly regulated industry. It was medical devices. I uh, had a ton of litigation, a ton of high risk litigation. So our focus was much more on cost savings. Um, at Dolby, you know, we're actually a profit center and not a cost center. So the priorities are, are pretty different. Um, but I've, I've been really lucky to work at two, two really great organizations, two very visionary general counsels, and two really talented groups of legal professionals. Well, you, you touched on a bunch of really great issues there <laughs> that, that I want to dig into. Um, I love the concept of it is your job to to clear the way and prevent all the things that distract lawyers from being lawyers. Um, g give us a couple of examples of that. I, I, I actually, I, I would, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of lawyers uh, who are quite distracted don't realize that that so much of what they do, this is both law firm and in-house, uh, is not essentially the practice of law. Um, what are some of those things and how the hell do you clear the road? Yeah, the easiest win, I think, is something like approving invoices. Um, so something as simple as implementing some standard billing guidelines or partnership guidelines, uh, and then implementing a billing tool that lets you automate those guidelines and those rules, that can free up a ton of your attorney's times. Uh, time You don't realize how much time you spent looking at really mundane line items. So some sample things you might put into billing guidelines are just tedious administrative tasks that they don't cost a lot of money, but it's really a lot of noise and it creates a lot of time uh, that's it's really it's it's not getting the law firm a lot of money, but it's wasting the law firm's time. It's wasting your attorney's time. It's clogging up your database with meaningless line items. So anytime you're charging me three cents, 
and writing about it, that is a waste of time for two people <laughs> who are worth up to like $1,500 an hour. <laughs> so that's the kind of white noise we just try to eliminate. To be fair, you're still leaving the lawyers at least some tedious mundane tasks, I hope. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's only so much time in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so another uh, another thing, and the, and, and the second one I actually want to spend a little bit more time on, um, you, you said that at Dolby, you're actually a profit center, not a cost center. Um, that, that that's the first time I've actually heard that. That I think that 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 that's pretty fantastic. Um, could you explain a little bit to the audience, like what that means and and, and how it changes uh, the way you actually operate? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Dolby brand is huge, and I'm sure everyone has heard of that, but maybe the doesn't movie, know exactly movie, what you do. Right. Um, so core to our business is licensing. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have a really strong patent prosecution team. We have a really strong patent licensing team. But then something that I didn't know about until I worked at Dolby was we also have a really strong IP protection team. And they go after people who are either using our logo or using our technology, but not paying for it. So between the licensing and the going after people who are are stealing our technology or stealing our logo, um, we become pretty profitable as a department. Ah, uh, so that's great. So so the department itself is generating revenue for the company, and therefore it's uh, kind of treated as 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 an arm of of revenue generation as opposed to the traditional legal center. Is that fair? Exactly. So we're we're almost like a sales org. And how does that how does that impact the culture? Like like, does it make you more risk prone? Like how, how does it actually trickle down into real differences that that people can understand? Yeah, so we're still you know we're still held to a P and L, so we still look at our expenses and we're still careful with our costs. Um, but we spend a lot more time focusing on revenue than expenses, uh, which is probably more interesting. <laughs> Uh, we, you know, oh, yeah. we, in my last role, we had a lot of time dedicated to cost savings programs and budget. And now it's really a total shift in focus to, you know, it's, it's revenue. It, it's not so much expense and what are we cutting? It's what are we growing and how can we build a new revenue stream? Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's really cool. And, and, uh, does the world of legal technology impact that? Like, yeah, absolutely. We uh, <laughs> Our biggest project that's been going on for a couple of years is uh, building internally uh, technology that our IP protection team can use to find out who to target um, and provide dashboards looking at, you know, what doesn't match up in terms of who's reporting units of sales versus what are we seeing um, reported online. It, it's just like it's a lot of spider webbing technology to find. <laughs> Where, where's our technology going and who's actually paying for it? And then finding the missing gaps of who's not paying for it, but who do we see using it? Uh, that's really interesting. So, okay. So for people that don't have a deep understanding of, of legal ops, uh, you know, I, I think, I think I love the catchphrase getting rid of things that distract lawyers from being lawyers, but let's, let's dig another layer down. Um, I know uh, vendor management, legal technology, process design, what are the core what are the core, I guess, uh, sticks in the bundle uh, of, of, of what legal operations does every day? And then, then maybe we'll get into kind of the differences between uh, your, your work at your two organizations. So sticks in the bundle first. Sorry, compound. Yeah, first. so I think, you know, I've always thought of legal operations as kind of people process technology. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that. <laughs> but that's, that's kind of core. Uh, you know, so people taking care of your people, making sure they're happy, you know, happy people do good work, mm -hmm. um, making sure that you're communicating, that you're providing opportunities for them to connect, that you're providing growth opportunities, um, just making work a rewarding place to be with people who are happy to be there. Um, process, you know, looking at how do we do things? Is there a more efficient way to do it? Are there things that we're doing that we really don't need to be doing or that we are doing that probably you know, some of our highest paid employees in the companies shouldn't be the one handling. Maybe we push those back to other departments. Um, and are there, are there, and then technology, are there tools that we can use to automate some of this work and allow us to scale with not ballooning our resources? 
Um, that, that's kind of the core. But then, of course, you know, legal operations is different at every single company, depending on the needs of that legal department. So the scope is very broad. It's really, you know, what does the GC need to do that isn't sure. necessarily legal in nature? So it can be anything from creating the department goals, creating metrics to measure performance against those goals. Um, it's usually the intermediary with the other functions within the organization, HR, IT, procurement, finance, um, sales ops. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time working with other departments, <laughs> not necessarily just within my department. So I, I've now been out of practice for 11 years. I, I finally deeply understand what legal operations is. I think in part, like you said, from working, you know, I, I've worked in sales organizations, uh, work alongside finance organizations. I, I, I'm curious whether the, the lawyers in both organizations you've now worked on, like, to what extent do they understand and not because they're stupid, they're brilliant people. I hope this doesn't come off that way. Um, but but it is a different, it is kind of a new role for, for the world of legal. Um, like wh which parts kind of resonate for them versus wh wh which parts do they kind of go, huh? Like wh what's your role in this? Yeah, so it really, I guess, depends which lawyer you ask um, because they all have a different perspective. So, you know, when I came to Dolby, they didn't have a, a a global legal ops function. There was no legal ops that was overarching across the department. Um, so there was a lot more skepticism and they didn't know me. So having to prove yourself as a stranger, you know, mm -hmm. a long way to go, especially if you have a lot of attorneys who have worked in house for 10 years and, you know, haven't been exposed to working with a legal ops function anywhere else. Um, when we would have new people come into the department, I, I knew like when they came from an organization that had a high functioning legal ops org because they would just bring me stuff. Oh, here you go, here you go. You know, things that I would be asking some of my other attorneys for that they were kind of hesitant maybe to give me sometimes. The newer attorneys were like, oh yeah, legal ops, this is your thing. Um, so I think it really depends on exposure to legal ops and then what legal ops means for the organizations that those people work in. It, it can be so different. Um, you know, you see, legal ops people coming from all different industries and backgrounds, anything from, you know, there might be a contract manager who is called head of legal ops because it's a small company and that's what they focus most of their time on. Or it might be, you know, a VP level attorney with an MBA <laughs> mm -hmm. who is focused more on the strategy of the department. So the spectrum of legal ops professionals is really broad. Um, and I think the reaction to legal ops depends a lot on which level you're exposed to. And like you said, the, just the wants and needs of, of the GC and the legal team in that particular organization. Um, so we touched on this before. Let's dig in. Uh, two brand name, uh, you know, world famous companies, Dolby and Boston Scientific, but 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 also two companies that that are in completely different industries have very different regulatory impacts. And then obviously uh, the, the the difference that, that you noted before being a cost center versus being a profit center. Um, how did that manifest itself in, in the day to day? Like what was it like building each of those uh, operations? That's yeah, so, a that's a big loaded question. Right now. So <laughs> well, but make it apart very, as you see fit. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's funny. It's a lot of the same responsibilities, but the day to day is very different. Mm -hmm. um, so at Boston Scientific, I had started that role as the finance manager for our legal, government affairs, regulatory, and compliance organizations, um, and just pointed out that, you know, we could be leveraging a lot of opportunities if we were operating as one department instead of as individual practice areas. Um, so I ended up drafting a legal ops role which I did not know was a, a thing that existed. <laughs> it was still pretty new back then. And I, I really didn't know of many others that were even happening on the East Coast at that time. Um, but coming into the role from a finance perspective, I had already, as finance manager, taken over e-billing, implemented reporting, um, done all of our data cleansing, basically shut down all of the ways that our data could get muddied by having too many hands in the pot, <laughs> um, too many cooks in the kitchen. 
so I had already been doing a lot of that work. It was just under a different title. So in that role, it was really easy for me to step in. Um, and, you know, when I took that role, I moved in from, from finance and my boss said, please get them on budget and please get them to stop closing deals mid-January. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and my GC, you know, in my interview, he said, I don't want to be read anymore on these reports because we had the, the stoplight reports. So that was really easy. Fine. You'll never be read again. I can promise that we never were. Um, it was a much bigger focus on budget and making sure we had predictability, understanding what we were spending, implementing alternative fee structures to make sure that nothing was going off the rails and we weren't aware of it. Um, implementing, you know, billing guidelines that could be automated. It was more focused on, you know, we have this huge budget and how do we manage it? When I came to Dolby, uh, the focus was more on, we need to modernize, we need to be scalable. So it was a very different twist. So I spent a lot more time on technology now, whereas I spent a lot more time on budget and savings programs and how do we get people excited to have like an efficiency program, which doesn't excite everybody <laughs> <laughs> until you provide incentives and then everyone else wants to get involved. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very true. And, 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 I, and, you know, it's a good transition to uh, maybe moving along a little bit to the world of legal technology. Um, you know, you described differing responsibilities, you know, over time, one more about budgeting and one more about uh, bringing in efficiency and, and tools. Um, you know, I, I, I guess it, it, it will be impossible to say, but it, it might be the changing world, obviously. Uh, you know, just 10 years ago, there were a handful of legal technology and innovation companies. Now, there's so many that, uh, you know, we opened a company that spends our, all of our time trying to, trying to vet them and understand them. And it's becoming <laughs> incredibly, incredibly complex. So you and I have talked a lot about uh, the world of legal technology. We're all seeing this boom. Um, we're seeing more and more vendors open their doors, but we're also seeing existing vendors, um, you know, achieve billion or multi-billion dollar valuations. Um, how does this kind of, how, how has the ex absolute explosion of legal technology kind of like impacted the job of a legal operations professional? Oh yeah, good question. So, you know, since I've been doing legal operations, the right, you're right, the marketplace has really exploded. exploded. <laughs> different yeah. vendors, different tools, different capabilities. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are still new and fresh and still being baked out. Um, but what's awesome about it is, you know, when I first started, you would go to your, I, I don't even know how to say it without sounding terrible. <laughs> <laughs> your giant tech company and they didn't care what you wanted oh, or needed oh. or what you were willing to pay for something. The price is the price. You get what you get. Your customer service is what it is, which is pretty much non-existent. Um, and that was that, even if you're spending half a million dollars a year with them. Mm -hmm. um, what these newer vendors are bringing to the space is a real interest in what do you want? What can I build you? How do I make your lives easier? So it's so much more of a partnership. I love working with these smaller companies um, because they want to hear what you need and they want to build it. Um, one of the ones that I've worked with at both companies, that was it's a small company um, and everything, I, I call them all the time with my suggestions and opinions. And whereas I often get, yeah, that's not on the roadmap and we're probably not going to do that. They would say, oh, that's a great idea. I bet all of our clients would love that. And they built every single suggestion that I ever gave them. Yeah, that's, that's the partnership I want to have. That's what's really exciting about like the boom in tech companies that are popping up. It's really exciting because you're able to automate a lot more. And that means that my lawyers can be lawyers and not be, you know, clicking buttons and you know, reading about photocopies. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and we, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, which parts the lawyers find exciting, which parts they find kind of threatening and, and, and I don't know, <laughs> uh, maybe a little controlling. Are they enjoying the, the influx of, of legal technology and, and the now I think somewhat steady tick of kind of new things and new ideas and, and some change? <laughs> or is it is a mix? I mean, 
it's hard to say what lawyers are enjoying <laughs> as a general statement. Um, I know that's, that's the you know, would we <laughs> When we implemented um, e-billing at Boston Scientific, there would be complaining and complaining. And I would say, oh, like, do you want to go back to the days of getting, like, paper boxes full of a single invoice? And they would say, oh, God, no, that was terrible. This is way better. I'm like, okay, just <laughs> you've been complaining a lot about doing something different. I just want to bring that perspective back around. And then I think they start to appreciate Oh yeah, it used to be really awful, and this is a lot better. I just have to spend a few minutes to learn something new. Um, but but that's when you are proactively pushing a technology on them. A lot of times, it's the attorneys who are coming to legal ops saying, "Please help us with this. We've been trying to push this through the CIO for the past three years, and he keeps saying no." Um, and then you get to build a business case on their behalf, sure. and it's a much different experience. Um, or it might be a practice area, needs something, doesn't really know what's in the space, doesn't know how to build a business case, don't have the time to do it. They just know that they need something. Um, so then you get a much more appreciated response from, from that individual when somebody's asking for something versus being told, no, trust me, this is going to save you a ton of time. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And that's a fantastic role for the legal operations professional to be able to, to take like a concept from the lawyers and turn it into, you know, something real and uh, something that, that that helps their lives. Um, just to, to dig in on the kind of, again, the explosion in legal technology, um, what's been cool about it, at least from my point of view, is uh, we've seen four companies, I believe, in the last six months, you know, hit that unicorn status. Um, which used to mean unusual thing. It's not that unusual anymore, but but it is a really big deal for the legal world. We've seen Clio, Ironclad, Relativity, and Isertis. What strikes me as particularly interesting is th those companies are from all different areas uh, of legal, right? Everything from like small law firms, uh, small law firm management with Clio, Ironclad, uh, obviously contract lifecycle management, and Relativity li litigation. Um, so you see all different, completely different types of legal being reinvented by technology. Um, where do you see technology being able to have the most impact in the next, let's say, five, 10 years? Oh, uh, you know, one thing that we had had talked about previously was one great thing to come out of all these big investors is that companies now have the funding to build what they want to build. And what I've been seeing really recently is they're starting to invest a little bit more and actually bringing legal people into the legal tech space. Uh, what I had seen before and you know, most often is someone who's great at building technology, building something for this desperately in need area, but not necessarily from a point of the legal side and like what does the user actually need and want. And mm -hmm. I am seeing companies invest a little bit more in that. So I guess rather than choosing just one space of law that I would say would be the biggest impact, I think the biggest impact, at least from my perspective, is all of these companies across the spectrum actually building what we need mm -hmm. <laughs> and saying, oh, I've got a legal ops person or I've got an experienced person who has been the end user using this tool and complaining about it for five years, helping <laughs> me build our roadmap and helping us design because that takes again a lot of the noise out of their jobs so just make everybody's life easier make everything more efficient if you hire those legal ops people that have the experience um to, to build the tool design the roadmap it's going to make everybody happier it's going to make your end users happier your customers your investors it's just going to work a lot better yeah no absolutely and and uh and there's been some really big hires in that space um so you mentioned before that you like to work with smaller vendors. I, I totally get that. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. One of one of my other guests described the term technology Tetris um, <laughs> as trying to fit the pieces you know, together as they're, as they're falling. I would assume that one of the advantages of larger vendors or you know, kind of the more established players is is the connectivity. Um, I'm just curious your views on on uh, your game of technology Tetris at Dolby. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like they all need to be highly connectable because there is no one vendor that can tackle the whole legal space. Um, you know, there are a couple who might say that they can, but they're not going to be best in class in any of those areas. So 
I think the spin really went from 10 years ago, trying to find one monster vendor that can do it all and just living with what they give you to now finding the really specialized vendors in each space and making sure they're willing to play nice with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, I I haven't had the experience that like the big companies are are more connectable than the smaller ones. I've kind of found the opposite where, you know, the the newer players are really excited about building a a direct API and making things fully automated. Um, And then as the companies mature, that's when they turn on their professional services hat and say, oh, well, we could do that, but you you have to talk to our professional services team and we could build you something. And then that's when you start losing the interest. So I haven't noticed that the bigger vendors are are easier in that regard. I've I've noticed that like most things, you know, similar to working with law firms, the smaller ones are willing to work with you and they're more flexible and they're willing to put in the time and make that investment on your behalf. Um, No, I'm sure that's great to hear, especially for the, the listeners that are those those smaller companies that there's this frankly this openness to, to to working with I mean I've met some of the most brilliant people I've ever met in my life you know who have quit really high paying jobs in the law to 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 go after the legal technology market but um, now now they know who to talk to <laughs> sometimes they can get a lot of cold shoulders frankly that that there, there just isn't enough um, they feel that there's not enough uh, appetite for risk or I guess perceived risk to uh, to work, especially with corporations. Um, right. So, yeah, we're we're close to out of time. So I'm going to ask another, you know, just hail mary of a question. Uh, we talked about four big themes: uh, technology, globalization, regulation, uh, and out, and outside investment. Um, over the next ten years, like wh- wh- which of those excites you the most, and 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 if any, which of them scares you? Oh man, give them to me again. <laughs> We've got technology, uh, the creeping reach of technology, uh, globalization, the, you know, the, the shifting of work to yeah. places all over the world, uh, changing regulation, more of a lawyer fear um, that the, without the protection of, uh, of regulation that exists in the bar, uh, that work will go to non-lawyers. Uh, and, then, and then outside investment, which you know, touches on all of those. Like investment goes to your LSPs and those are globalization. Investment is flying to uh, new business models, uh, especially in the UK, but also right here in the US. We have two states allowing sandboxes now, uh, mixing you know lawyer and non-lawyer parties. So, so I mean, for me, the th- the thing that has always excited me most is the technology piece. Mm-hmm. You know, and even when I left Boston Scientific and was thinking about what to do next, I realized very quickly that what I really liked doing was the technology side of it. Yeah. Uh, and those were the vendors I liked working with. And th- that was just the stuff that I liked thinking about because it, it's just there's so many quick wins. You know, not that it's that easy to implement a tool, but there's so much opportunity for just taking away meaningless work and letting people focus on what actually matters. Um, And and I think that as workloads have just ballooned over time, it's hard to look at your own workload and think, how much of this is actually focusing on what I need to be doing? (laughs) Um, So I really think that technology has the biggest opportunity for change, no matter where you work. Um, So the ability to to, to, like tackle a problem and feel like, Wow, I think that that problem is done forever. Like we have just we've just automated right. that problem away. Is it's hard to go back once you once you've been able to do right. that. You just save one hundred percent of your attorney's time every day <laughs> on this <laughs> issue forever. Yeah, um, no, that's always cool. the most exciting to me. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much. This was a, this was a great talk, um, and thanks to the audience. I will see you again next week on Future Law Bootcamp. Thanks everybody, and thanks to Latera TV. Thanks for having me.